Welcome to the MPR Network and the Boas, Boas, Boas podcast. Today, we'll be introducing ourselves and our goals for the show. It's going to be a monthly broadcast covering all things Boas. So let's get started. So Warren, I guess, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and uh, let's start with that. Sure. Uh, so my name is Warren Booth. I'm, a, I'm an associate professor at the University of Tulsa. Uh, my work is pretty much evolutionary genomics based, working on urban insects, but we do a lot of work on, on reptiles, a lot of work on snake parthenogenesis. Um, but outside of that, for the last 27, 28 years, I've been keeping and breeding snakes. Originally, it was Western hognose snakes and some colubras, but very early on, I got into uh, Corallus triboas. And about the same time, I got into Boa imperator. Well, Boa sigma is then Boa, boa imperator. In, in that I got some Sonoran boas from a friend from Germany. And uh, I bred those totally unexpectedly. And uh, they produced anarthristics in the first litter, which were pretty much unheard of. Well, they, they were unheard of. And the demand for those resulted in lots of trades for, for rare boas uh, or rare boa morphs. And that kind of sparked this whole kind of hobby that I've been immersed in for the last, as I say, 27 years. And, and, and now I primarily keep boa imperator and boa sigma, um, two species that we'll talk about later on in this, uh, in this series. Um, and I also keep a lot of Corallus tree boas, emeralds, amazons, um, grenadensis, and then Corallus ruschenbergeri, which are the kind of larger cousins of the, of the amazons, the Trinidad tree boas and the Costa Rican tree boas. And um, I've got some Brazilian rainbow boas, um, some carpet pythons, some womas, um, and some duns pythons. Oh, and some blood pythons. Maybe I've, I've got too many snakes by the sounds of it actually there. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, my hobby has always been something that's bled into my, uh, into my work. Um, so being able to, you know, read scientific papers that are related to the species that I'm interested in, or closely related species has meant that I've been able to improve the way I keep my animals. Uh, and it's kind of informed how I should think about breeding and feeding and so on. Mm -hmm. How about you, Keith? Um, so basically, I'm more of a, I guess, from the practical standpoint of a keeper. Um, basically, it's just been a passion of mine. I'm 62 now. And I've been keeping exotic animals literally since I was three, four years old. Um, my uncle was an exotic vet, uh, so I had access to a lot of really cool things through him. But my parents at an early age saw that reptiles or any animal actually kept me out of trouble. So I was pretty much allowed to keep anything that I was uh, able to take care of. Um, so I started off with, you know, the local stuff that you could catch around here. And my first exotic snake was actually a boa constrictor. Um, and at the time, you know, they were always the iconic snake in any Tarzan or any type of, um, you know, shows or documentaries, you know, it always referred to the boa constrictor because even back then it was a, in the 60s, it was a iconic animal to the general public of, you know, a giant constricting snake. So um, boa constrictors have been in my life for literally nearly 60 years. Um, I've always had them. Um, I've varied f how big of a collection I've had of boa constrictors, but um, I've always had a few boas in my collection along along the way. Um, like you, I keep a lot of other stuff. I keep uh, Sanzinia and Rochenbergeri and some Amazon tree boas. I have a lot of northern emerald tree boas, um, Argentine boas, hog isle boas, um, some Guyana red tails um annulated boas um jamaican boas some candoya um i think that's about it for the boas i have a lot of other pythons and whatnot also um but my my niche has always been i like observing animals in captivity so um from the early on ages my goal was always to set up like a natural looking cage and and actually set it up so that I could watch the animals and how they act in captivity and try to equate that to how they act and survive in the wild. And all those aspects are really what I love about uh, reptiles in general. Um, but boas have always been one of the things that I've been drawn to. Um, 
And and lately, you know, with uh, Rob and some other people, I've uh, started getting into herping and seeing the animals out in the wild. Um, and that adds a lot of knowledge to how we keep in captivity. So I guess I'm more of a practical, from a practical background, um, on keeping animals and just uh, experiences the ups and downs and losses and goals and, and achievements along the way. Um, that's basically my, my background in the hobby. And we it's also kind of have funny, yeah. going now, here yeah. tonight. We do, yeah. Go on, Rob, tell us about your background. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Warren and Keith. Yeah, that's uh, not as impressive as either of you, but doing the best that I can. I've been, uh, you know, same, similar to Keith, keeping a whole host of things from a kid, but kind of more seriously into reptiles or continually into reptiles from a uh, pet store mall or a mall pet store boa constrictor, neonate boa constrictor infested with mites that, you know, didn't make it past three weeks. It wasn't situated yeah. to do well, you know, from the right. 97. And uh, since then, I've kept, rep, you know, snakes of varying different kinds, lizards as well. And um, yeah, right now, my focus in terms of boas is Puerto Rican boas, Jamaican boas and Solomon Island tree boas. Those are, yeah, I have a couple of corrales kicking around as well. And uh, yeah, uh, similar to Keith, you know, a whole host of other things over time. But uh, that's principally it for now, in addition to rhino rat snakes or the Vietnamese long nose rat snakes. So yeah, super excited. Uh, I think we have another uh, you know, points of focus for me have been rosy and rubber boas. So I think amongst all of us, save maybe the uh, tropidophis and the eyelash boas, ungaliophis, other than those things, I think we've got experience in all of us have experience in all these different things. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, listening to Keith, and I, just, I realized that he mentioned several snakes that I've also got that I didn't mention, things like Sanzinia. You know, how the hell can I not mention Sanzinia? But, <laughs> um, and also the herping aspect, you know, I, I suppose I never really thought about that. But, you know, I tend to go to Costa Rica every year and spend about two weeks in the rainforest. I bring students there on a course and, um, and seeing animals in the wild, seeing boa constrictors in the wild seeing Corallus annulatus in the wild is pretty amazing mm. it does make you think differently about the way you keep animals you know and 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 keith you're right you also said about mentioning uh, you mentioned setting up you know kind of natural enclosures and watching animals behave and and while i don't think people are, are going to see this video behind me in my in my office in my lab you know i've just got this wall of cages but these have all got anaconda phase uh Corallus in them apart from the bottom ones they got some um some costa rican russian burger eye but i set them up using natural branches and try to set them up as natural as, as possible for a PVC enclosure, you know, for a snake on a stick on a box. But, you know, it's amazing just watching these animals move around, thermoregulate, you know, sitting underneath the UV light to bask, moving away from it, just behaviors that I've have been missing from keeping them in slightly different ways, you know? So I think um, that's been something that's been really exciting for me. It's made me want to stay in my lab a lot longer in the evening, whenever I finished up and just, see what these things are doing. And it's always exciting to come in and feed them because I'll do that at around midnight or just before it. And they, they're really active, you know, so, mm -hmm. you know, like up, up on top, I've got a, an anaconda face female that, that was with a male. I never saw them breeding because just, I wasn't here. Um, but she's been sitting under a basking spot at 91 degrees for the last two months, yeah. you know, which is a great sight. You know, she's still feeding, uh, but she's got every opportunity to, to move away from that heat, but she's choosing to stay on it, you know, and, and that's something that I wouldn't have observed in, in keeping them in different ways. So it's, mm -hmm. um, I like kind of I, observing animals in the wild and trying to replicate that in captivity is great, you know, and, and that's hard whenever, you know, it, it's very common for us to keep animals in, in Rubbermaid type tubs or in, in rack systems and we lose, you know, being able to see them, you know, so this transition back to cages is something that I'm finding pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess that falls kind of along the lines of goals for the show. And uh, Warren, I'll go back to you to start um, as far as what you feel some of the goals we're going to try to achieve, uh, the three of us here talking about the different boa species. Yeah, so, you know, Rob mentioned we, we have a wealth of experience among the three of us with a whole variety of species of boas. Um, there's not many species that we haven't kept um, for a period of time. Uh, and, you know, I think that provides us diversity to think about you know, the, the type of animals we want to talk about uh, and, and provides longevity for the for the show. Um, but what I really want is, you know, after, you know, I listen to a lot of reptile podcasts 
uh, and have done for a number of years. And I got excited whenever Vin Russo started his show and that disappeared. And I got excited whenever the Boa Rack Radio kind of crowd did their show and it disappeared. And kind of as a Boa guy that will listen to anything reptile is fine. But as a Boa guy, I kind of re- there, there was nothing there. There was this just hole. There was a void. Uh, and it and it and it's certainly needed filled. So whenever Eric and Rob were plaguing me back and forth, the odd little message about my interest in doing a podcast, and I have liked being on them, but I'd never thought about doing one. Um, you know, I just thought this could be something that could be really neat, where we take it a little bit further, and we you know don't just talk about keeping and breeding, but we think about behavior, we think about evolution, we think about genetics, and therefore we think of this more holistic kind of. Um, idea when we're keeping animals when we're thinking about animals and how we can learn about how to keep some animals from totally different species you know um and i think i kept saying no or i'll think about it and then i thought well i'll only do it if keith does it (laughs) and uh and i think it was because of a post that you had mentioned on a on one of the npr groups and then you said yes and i thought oh God, that's it. I put my foot in an eye. You know, I, I really got to do this. <laughs> <laughs> but I, th- I think it's going to be great. I, d- I want it to be, I want it to be fun for people to listen to. I want everybody to get something different from it. You know, right. I don't want it just to be the, here's this color morph and here's this color morph and so on, all of the same thing. And how did you get into reptiles? And you know, you know, for lasting for two hours. You know, I want us to get if we talk about. Um, Emerald tree boas. I want us to think deeper about emerald tree boas. I want to think about, you know, what happens in the wild, the diversity of that that um, phenotype across its range. How do we keep them? What's gone wrong with them? You know, who are the pioneers in the hobby, and where has it taken us, and where do we need to go? I think you know that that last bit of where are we now and where can we take this? I think is really important because that will allow the evolution of the hobby, and the maintenance of our interest in species. Right. Right. Uh, Rob, what do, what are some of your goals for the show? Well, I agree with all the stuff that Warren laid out there. It actually prompts me to think about just from the uh, Southern California trip that we were just on. Eric had mentioned from talking to Mark Hager, uh, the question of, hey, do you notice sort of syncing between males and females when they're paired for breeding? And then when the female ovulates, you get a shed from both the male and the female. And obviously that's something that's good. There are so many dependencies that go into that in terms of how much you're, if you're feeding them, how much you're feeding them, the size you're feeding them, all these different things. But I was able to give a hard yes. And this was a question that Mark had asked saying, hey, I've, I've noticed this. I believe in chondros and saying, yeah, actually, I saw it last year in Jamaican boas where the I had pair, put this pair together. And weirdly, I didn't get a shed that I anticipated post ovulation from the Jamaican bow. And she wound up shedding 40, 45 days later. But the male shed when I thought that they would both shed and uh, her litter was dropped according to the time when he shed. So for whatever reason, she didn't have that, you know, she either had shed too soon previously or whatever factor, right? Cosmic octopus, as I always say, of all, you know, essentially speaking to the limitations of the human mind relative to the realities of the universe. But um, this is, you know, the sort of thing that it's like, oh, actually, I have a solid answer to that. And it's based on to Warren's point, observation in cages, and then looking at it in this this uh, sphere of saying, hey, I'm taking a look at them, I'm observing these things, and then what can we apply from that? And on those singular pairings, uh, you know, yeah, I had a solid answer that I felt very confident in because I had just seen it and seen it play out to its full extent. So I think all mm-hmm. that stuff's fantastic. To Warren's point, I think just having the boa content, you know, I, I, pythons are cool. Boas are really cool. You know, they, they just are. And I feel like in terms of podcast content, I'm like you, Warren, I've taken in all this different stuff. I appreciate all of it, but, um, while there have been other avenues that I've definitely appreciated, uh, unfortunately most of those have fallen off and then the archives have fallen off. So, uh, I hope that we can provide really good content that at this point is underutilized. Yeah. So for me, I agree with that also. So, but for me, some of the thing, well, one of the selfish things that I'm glad about this show and one of the goals of the show is I feel that I'm going to learn a lot from it. I'm going to learn a lot from um, doing research for the show for the next topic we're on and getting input from you guys and roundtabling stuff. I think we're going to, we're going to have stuff blossom out of our conversations that we didn't even think about before the show. We're going to kind of go off in these tangents probably 
um, for things that we bring up. So I'm looking forward to um, exploring all of that kind of stuff. Um, and the other goal for me is um, I, I was surprised at the Tinley show when I had brought some um, green Sanzinia for Paul to check out um, Mitzfeld and I, I pull them out and everybody walking by the table was like, what is that? What is that? I've never seen it. And, and I tell them it's a green Sanzinia, it's Sanzinia metagrinsis. And they're like, what is that? I've never even heard of it. And to us, of course, you know, that's a staple in the hobby that has always been a very desirable and not a very um, easily found animal. But we all knew about it and all know about it clearly. But I, I would say 90% of the people going by that table had no idea what that was. So I'm hoping we can draw people in and 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 realize like how many different species of boas there are in this world and the niches that each one fulfills in nature. You know, everybody thinks when you say boa right away, they just think a boa constrictor and that's it. But there's so many from, you know, a mere 18 inches long up up until the anaconda of, you know, 20 foot plus. Um, so there's animals that fill every niche from the trees to underground and everything. So I'm looking forward to exploring all the different species and hopefully getting people um, excited about all that different stuff that's out there for for them to, to learn about and, and possibly keep one day. So, you know, that's probably my biggest goal for the show. Yeah, I think that's awesome. I think, you know, again, it allows us to think about this in in different ways we can bring our own little kind of bits and pieces to it you know and it is funny that you say about sanzinia i you know the same thing as people have said to me about you know a lot of the corrales tree boas they had no idea there was something really different than an emerald tree boa or an amazon yeah. you know or uh, the amount of people that you know are just starting to realize that that boa what we consider boa constrictor is really quite a diverse group Mm -hmm. You know, most people have never seen a boa nebulosa or a boa right. rofius. And mm -hmm. sadly, it's very likely they never will, you know. But even then, you know, they don't really know about boa sigma. They don't know a lot about the localities of boa imperator. They think, sadly, they think more of, many people think more of um, of color morphs. Right. You know, and, and I think it's going to be exciting. Once, they, once people start realizing about all of this diversity across species, and the availability of it, and some of it is available in the hobby. I think that's going to make, be exciting for many people to start thinking about delving into new avenues of keeping things, you know? Right. Um, you know, certainly whenever I started keeping, it was, you know, albino, anarthristic, hypomelanistic. This is awesome. And as a geneticist, this was the Mendelian genetics, kind of, you know, the snake version of, of Mendel's pea plants, you know, but boas were much more exciting, mm -hmm. you know? So... Um, but it was, you know, shortly after that, that I started realizing after, after a trip to a friend's house in England, who was an importer, but also a locality boa guy, this is maybe 24, 25 years ago, he had boa nebulosa and he had boa orophius and I didn't appreciate them then because I didn't know about them and I didn't know how rare they were going to become, you know, and now I look back and think, gosh, he had first generation hog islands and those things at night turned milk white and pink. They were just unreal. He's the guy that got me the, the, the Sonoran boas, the boa sigma. And without that, I don't know where I'd be in this hobby, you know? Yeah. And, um, and it's just amazing where we had people like that, that had such a, a knowledge of the diversity of the species and the, the localities. And then it faded away and went into kind of color morphs and pattern morphs. Mm -hmm. I think we're now moving away from that again, where people are now becoming really interested in localities again as well. Yeah. And, and the cool thing also is that, you know what, you can still be interested in color morphs because there are lo localities with color morphs, right. you know, and you can keep those pure, you know, and I think hopefully people are going to learn that, you know, as they, as they start listening to this show over time. Yeah. And, and Warren, to your point, as you're mentioning these species of even just the boa constrictor complex, mm -hmm. look at the diversity of where they live. Like, I know. like, 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 you have such a wide range where each species and locality come from and, and how that environment has adapted their, their body structure and their, and their coloring. And I don't think even a lot of people even realize all, all of the different um, species and locality of just boa constrictor, you know? Yeah. And what that does to breeding, right? So you, you can't breed a, a Sonoran boa the same way as you breed a, a Guiana boa, totally right. different, right? right? You know, 
Sonoran boas get cold at night. Guiana boas don't have much temperature change across their year at all. Right. You know, so we not, we need to start thinking more about what are the environmental cues that would trigger breeding, when do they breed, and so on. You know, so I think you know this will hopefully bring a little bit of um, flavor to that for people to start thinking about how they keep their animals and how they might start breeding them. And hopefully we'll be able to bring on some some guests that are really knowledgeable in those areas as well right. to help educate people in those in those kind of questions. And, but and yeah, those, yeah, sorry, but, but even, you know, you're saying about boas, boas are diverse, but then you get into things like the Candoria. Those things are just insane, you know? <laughs> um, the, the phylogeny, how those species, what is a species and how they're related is still really not well understood at all, you know? Right. So, um, and that that's a group that I think is going to really start to flourish once people are breeding them in captivity and they get them into, you know, starting on small, on, on rodents, that's going to be a species that just takes off, I think. Mm -hmm. or, or, sorry, a group, a genus that takes off. Yeah. Right, right. So I think uh, we also would maybe put into the show tonight, um, this is actually a precursor just to kind of let everybody know what the show is going to be about. But maybe uh, we could touch on what everybody's got going on this year so that uh, we can update everybody that's listening on what we're working with and and uh, all that kind of stuff. So, Rob, I don't know, uh, what do you have going on this year with BOAs? Um, so I, I anticipate firmly having one litter of Puerto Rican BOAs. And I have a couple shots at the Solomon Island tree BOAs, the Australis. I based on the signs they're showing me again speaking to cages um i think i thought they were i thought one was good but i i suspect i won't get anything the puerto ricans are showing all the normal um normal normal signs so i expect for boas that'll be it for me this year is a litter of the inornatus the puerto rican boas i will say just just as a momentary jump in warren when you talked about the uh nebulosa man the uh, hair on my arm stood up right that's speaking to the diversity and all the things that get us excited that that's something that i'm similarly situated where it wasn't it was something that was semi-available when i first started certainly presented as a an aspirational thing and now is just under unavailable and uh mm -hmm. yeah I, I just you know that was my instant reaction is man there's so many so many cool boas is that you brought it to the fore of mind and Holy moly. Yeah, it generated a reaction for sure. Uh, and what's funny about that even is that um, there are some breeders in Europe that had Nebulosa and had Orophius and got rid of them from their collections because they considered them ugly. <laughs> you know, and I'm just like, it's like, crazy. I, right. Yeah. The first Nebulosa that I saw were long, slender, dark, aggressive. And I thought, why would anybody want those animals before I knew what they were? were? This is from the guy that keeps Trinidad tree, but was now that are long, slender, and will just try and kill you. But um, the the even the, the the phenotype of Nebulosa, whenever you see them, is to just totally different. They're just just amazing. And again, and it just similar to, to, to what you said, Rob, in the UK and in Europe, um, to a point they were available and then just disappeared. You know, it's uh, it's kind of tragic to see the loss of that kind of species from. From the hobby and even Arophius, there's there's probably more boa Arophius, but still just not a lot of them going around, you know. And people just have no idea what they are. And the weird thing is that you could put a nebulosa and an Arophius and a sun glow boa on a table together side by side at Tinley, and those other two are gonna get ignored, and the sun glow boa is the one that's gonna get all the attention. Mm -hmm. You know, people have got no idea about those two ugly boas, the wild type ones that are beside it, you know. So hopefully we'll be able to educate some people about that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So Warren, you, I, I was going to ask you first, Warren. All right. Um, <laughs> you know, this year is weird because this year is the first year that I've really taken a step back, you know, other than the year that I moved to the U S so like 2000 and whatever that 2006, you know, this year, every, every year, um, I normally have maybe five to seven boa, Sigma boa Imperator litters. Um, and maybe some Corallus or maybe some Epicrates kind of litters. And this year I just, and, and they always, <laughs> the, the boa constrictors are always born literally in a window whenever I'm away. Every year, my wife and I, my family and in-laws and stuff tend to go back to the Outer Banks. I used to live in North Carolina when I moved to the U.S. And, and I love the Outer Banks. And uh, 
we would rent a place there for two or three weeks. And, and the, between the drive from Tulsa, Oklahoma to there and back again, you know, this made a three or four week vacation. Every year, these boas are being born whenever I'm away. <laughs> and there's always, and I, we, you know, we would have house sitters or whatever, but they don't know how to deal with it. And, you know, an aggressive female boa that's just given birth or if there was a stillborn baby or there's just, just the, the afterbirth, the clean it, you know. Yeah. And, um, and this year I just thought, you know, maybe I'm going to step back this year from breeding I'll let, like I've got, it's not, I don't breed females yearly, um, but I just thought maybe I'll just give them a, a, another year off. I'll put some more weight on them and really go for it um, next year. But, you know, some females will tell you that they want to go and they're developing follicles and so on. So I think I've got a gravid um, Inca uh, Nicaraguan boa that is het Costa Rican T positive. And I bred her to a hypomelanistic um, het Costa Rican T positive hat leopard so that could be a fun pairing in terms of you know it's it's a it's a hybrid right it's a boa sigma and a boa imperator cross but the babies could be pretty exceptional the costa rica t positive line i think is just amazing mm -hmm. um i've got i i did pair up a costa rican t positive with a pure um wild type female costa rican which is just out of this world and i would like to see something from them it would be nice to get a litter of pure pet costa rican t positives um what else did I pair up? I, I paired up a, a pure Sonoran anarthristic leopard with a pure Sonoran hypomelanistic head anarthristic, and they were certainly breeding. Um, so I'll wait and see what happens there. And other than that, um, I didn't really pair up anything, but I've got, I've got a gravid Northern Emerald at home. Um, she's a female that I bred two years ago, and um, she produced five babies two years ago that were just exceptional. It's the first time that I saw orange baby emerald tree boas, which was kind of really cool. So we had mm. orange and we had red babies in that litter, um, which was really interesting because the orange, they went through their, their ontogenic color change within a matter of months and were green within a matter of months, whereas the red ones were still going through it a year and a bit later. So I'm really excited about that pairing because it's the same male that bred her. It's a, it's a signal herp, Regal Walder produced animal. So he's about 12, I think 12, 13 years old now. And um, so she's gravid, she's basking. Um, I may have a, a gravid anaconda phase bred to another anaconda phase. Um, I'm really, they're, they're a, a phenotype of, of Corallus caninus that I just love. And a couple of years ago, I, I invested in getting a, a group of wild caught anaconda phase animals. And I took the time to establish them. They're absolutely thriving. Um, the females behind me, like, well, probably five and a half, six feet and eat adult rats, you know, and just, just amazing. So that, that the female is one of the females is basking at like 91 degrees. So, you know, that we'll see what she does. Um, and I've got a female Costa Rican Ruschenbergeri, Corrales Ruschenbergeri, the black tail boas that may be gravid as well. She's doing everything that she should be doing. And she produced for me two years ago as well. So in fact, she produced, I think, just a couple of days before your litter, a couple yeah, of I years think ago. So. So they, and yeah. they're, they're probably they're probably related. They they came from my Eli? friend. Yeah, uh, well, mine yeah, mine came from uh, Kessel Dwyer. Okay, um, you know, maybe I got mine. Um, I got mine nine years ago, ten years, nine or ten years ago. I was actually in the rainforest in Costa Rica, and uh, I saw uh, an email came through. It was uh, Bushmaster's um, list. Mm -hmm. uh, Cameron's list and, and he had a trio of Russian burger eye on it. And I've been looking for Russian burger eye for 20 something years. I've lost a lot of money trying to buy them and I'm just not arriving. And, uh, and I, as soon as I was there, I, I called them up credit card details. They were bought. And, uh, I thought it was funny that I was in the rainforest in Costa Rica, buying animals that were produced in Costa Rica, that was then <laughs> sitting in Colorado. Funny and two days that. after I arrived back from the rainforest, they arrived at my lab and they've, they've just been exceptional. Um, I didn't pair up um, Trinidad tree boas this year. I was going to, um, I just didn't get around to doing it, um, but I'll do that next year. But, you know, just thinking about it, I thought I'd only had a couple of animals, but there's probably, there's, you know, there's probably five or six pairings that are there that should be doing something, you know, so we'll, we'll wait and see. Nice. Yeah. How about you, Keith? Uh, so I have a couple things going on. I feel very confident with my black tail tree boas this year. This, the females all feed and she definitely ovulated and she's doing a lot of basking and all her typical things. This will be her fourth litter with me. 
Um, so I'm pretty confident with her. Um, I have a green Sanzinia that I am going to say 85%, you know, it's a Sanzinia, so I'm not going to say hundred percent, but <laughs> I'm 85% confident with her. She's going to go for me this year. Um, and that's a funny thing. It's just, uh, everything clicks for me with, I think it's just my conditions in this, uh, area that I keep them in, in my house. Um, cause I really don't do much with them, um, compared to what other people do as far as the cooling and everything else, you know, it's just, I think just the way I got them set up here. So if it isn't broke, I'm not going to change it. But you know, when I listen to how other people breed them, it's so different than the way I breed them. So, um, last year I was successful and this is a different female this year and she's going through the same routine as the female last year. So I'm very hopeful for her. Um, it looks like I have two female emeralds that are uh, definitely gravid. They both have ovulated and then uh, did their shed 21 days later. So I'm confident with them. They're both females that have bred a couple times for me in the past. So those I'm pretty confident with. Um, I have an Argentine boa female um, that's looking very promising, which is very exciting to me because I haven't done those in many many years so it's really cool to have a pair again that'll hopefully uh produce for me um i have a hog isle female that looks to be gravid so i'm excited about that again another species that i haven't done for many many years um i have a candoya uh um a solomon island ground boa she's looking really good she's uh off feed now so i'm hoping that i get some babies from her that's a species i actually haven't done before so i'll be picking rob's brain when it comes time <laughs> to feed babies on those for sure um so yeah that one will be exciting if uh, she drops as many babies as i've heard that they can that should be fun to try to get all those old monsters going but yeah, i'm looking forward to that um what else uh, oh, I have an annulated boa that I'm, um, she just shed, um, after her ovulation. So I'm starting to count days for her too. Um, so yeah, I got a couple things cooking. I got a lot of odd pairs. I used to, you know, back in the day, keep, you know, 20 pairs of each species I have nowadays. I tend to keep, you know, 2.3 is probably the max on most stuff, but my Northern emeralds, um, you know, I have, uh, maybe 25 animals. So mm -hmm. those, uh, I have a bigger collection of, but most everything else I try to keep like at 2.3 now. It's just easier yeah. for me to take care of everything. Yeah, I think, you know, with that in mind, you know, I, I've looked at my animals this year and I just thought, you know, I'm probably going to, with my boa sig, well, my boa imperator, I'm probably going to re reduce that kind of collection this year. Just going to select a handful of animals from that there and, and maybe move the rest on. I, I've got, you know, carpet pythons that I, that I put out in long-term breeding loan with a friend and I've got some other animals I'm going to do that with, you know, just to minimize or, or not minimize, but reduce the number of animals that I've got here. Mm -hmm. It's amazing whenever you breed snakes, especially some of the rarer things or the more like the, 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 the Northern emeralds, how many you want to keep back, yeah. you know, you know, cause getting captive born and bred emerald tree bows is just not easy to do. Mm -hmm. Same thing with Russian burger eye, same thing with, you know, annulated boas and so on it's amazing how suddenly your your baby racks start filling up and they're not things that are meant to be getting moved out but the things that are staying you know so i, I i've looked at <laughs> i've looked through my my animals this this last few weeks and i'm like yeah i think i really do need to to minimize some of these things you know reduce them a little bit because i want to i want to invest more of my time in the corralis as well yeah. you know and I've, I've got i've got so many corralis that there's just, I couldn't, and I wouldn't want to, you know, I wouldn't want to move out, you know, if anything, I want to build that kind of group. So, right. um, you know, so it's, um, yeah. Speaking of Kandoria, I do not envy you at all about those <laughs> babies. Years ago, I worked in a store and we had a, we had a Kandoria give birth and it was just, those things were, were, uh, like viral refills, you know, in terms of their diameter. Yeah. And I just thought this is a nightmare. And it's so funny because I had, I have, I have um, a handful of um, uh, the their eye uh, king snakes, mm -hmm. and uh, I put them into my vision rack. Oh, I don't know when, you know, a bunch of months ago. <laughs> and that very first night, they all got out of that vision. Yeah, hundred percent. 
I'm, what are I'm you doing here? Thinking, I'm thinking, well, how did the hell did they get out of it? I'm, I'm shining lights to try and see if there's any kind of, no idea. You know, baby hognose snakes, get out of that freaking rack. And I'm crawling around hands and knees in my basement trying to find these things. So I think the Candoia, I, I don't envy you on, uh, on that whole process. Yeah. yeah. But, I th- but I think it'd be really cool to breed them. Yeah. yeah. Well, Rob, you had some success last year with the, the uh, tree boa, right? That was 2018. Yeah. yeah, 2018 into 19 with the tree boas. Yeah, I bred them. They're, you know, I think you just, uh, I've actually experienced this with the subflavus, the Jamaican boas, that if we're talking about streamlined snakes, right, the part that people miss about not wanting to feed lizards, right, is that the width of a pinky mouse is equivalent to an anole or any anola species that's probably six inches long. And that's may arguably before you even get to the tail, right? So the biomass that they're ingesting, it, it's just wholly different, right? A pinky that might be 10 grams is the same width and extension on a snake of an anolis that might be 50 grams. So the substance that that provides is wholly different. And I think we need to, that'll be conversation for down the road. I would point out, so just right. a couple, couple little bits to jump in while I can. Um, that, uh, I think Eli produced your animals, right, Keith? So those will be one generation down the track from yours, Warren. So these are Quetzal plus one, um, is is Keith's stuff. But, uh, yeah, I think that's all fantastic. Keith, is the Paulson eye the one that I sent you or no? I assume no, because they take so long to get big. Well, your male is the guy that got the job done to the white female that I had here when you came to visit and you saw Okay, cool. Very cool. And it, Warren, his hog island bows, outstanding, uh-huh. heavily flecked, totally beautiful. I mean, Keith will tell you, I start, I had pulled one out. It was what it wanted to give me a go for an hour as I'm just holding the thing, looking at you know, it was beautiful. Do you know yeah. what line you are? What line uh, you are? Uh... I got them from Vin Russo. Oh, you got oh, Russo, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So I've got... I've got um, Sears line animals. I've got 2.2. So I've got Sears line and I've got, um, I've got Shewitt line. So that's a line that not a lot of people remember, but my, my buddy Gordon Shewitt and his brothers bred jungle carpets, uh, Brazilian rainbow boas, hog island boas um, in the in the 80s and 90s. So um, uh, it's nice to have that Shewitt line animal or those Shewitt line animals here. And I've got another one that came from uh, from Arkansas, and it was it was uh, it was bred by um, a, a university um, keeper, um, I think, in the biology department. And he didn't even know what line it's been because he's had that line for the last twenty something years. Huh. So it's probably just one of these ones from the from the wild that that he has just maintained. And it's really cool because it's striped. So it, it was breeding my my female my large female this year. But um, she just shared. She's not. She's not sitting in the beehive, so I don't think she's going to do anything. But I'd love to get a litter from her and, and send you some for your group. You know, it'd be kind of. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big Hog Island fan, and and I've loved yeah. them for for many years. My uh, a great friend of mine, Jonathan Harvey, got a trio of them 20, 26 years ago or so, maybe twenty seven years ago, somewhere around there. Uh, so these would have been wild caught animals they were adults but whenever they came in they both the the, th- the three of them started stargazing and oh. uh, very quickly rolled over so they picked up something um, and that's whenever ibd was really a big scary thing in europe yeah. um, and he lost that trio and and um and over the years i've picked up the odd pair here and there but they haven't stayed around very long i don't know why just like boa along the the longa cotta you know i used to have a an exceptional pair of longa cotta and for some stupid reason, I sold them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. I had this beautiful pair of Guiana um, constrictor, captive bred, did the same thing. I sold them to the same guy that bought my longa cotta, you know, and I'm now going through my like my old hotmail email trying to find that guy's that guy's email address to see if yeah. I can, if he still got them. You know, the, the silly things that I've done over the years in, in getting great animals and then letting them go, you know, I, I don't know. That's actually a good topic right there because uh, I had some insane Madagascar ground boas and 
Oh. I went and traded them off for uh, getting the funds to get some emeralds that I wanted. And now I'm kicking myself. I'm like, why didn't I just keep that here? <laughs> yeah. But I was talking to, uh, online. Uh, somebody posted a picture of the uh, Tracy Aboa. Uh -huh. um, I think Ryu and Ari posted a picture or something. So I was mentioning how Tom Crutchfield used to have them on his uh, price list back in the day. And I'm like, man, you know, the things that we could have gotten back in the day, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Back whenever there was no real regulation for getting them. Yeah. 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 Just crazy. I think uh, it amazes me how much, uh, you know, I like it. It's funny, you know, like uh, not boas, but pythons. You know, I, I keep this pair of Dunn's pythons that, mm -hmm. uh, that Ryan Young gave me. Yeah. And and it's it's ridiculous that 20 years ago i saw duns pythons whenever they first came in and they were on liz phillips price list in the uk and like they were the equivalent of like 100 bucks each adult wild caught right and um you know it's everybody just forgot about them and then they literally almost went extinct in the hobby yeah you know the trinidad trebo was they did go extinct in the hobby essentially right you know and we were lucky to bring some in a couple of years ago and we've we've produced three or four liters of those you know and we're we're, we're doing a lot of work with those but it's uh, it's amazing these things that we've had in our hands and we've let them totally slip by you know yeah. in favor of what was kind of cool at the time or you know it, it's it's uh it, you know it's kind of crazy to lament on all of the uh the the opportunities we had over the years it's an evolution, right? Um, just like us as keepers, you know, uh, a lot of us and myself included went through the morph phase where, you know, it was all about breeding morphs when I did my time with blood pythons and short tails. Um, that's, you know, the, was the bulk of my collection. And my goal was always to produce the, the first look of something new that mm -hmm. year and all that kind of stuff, you know. And then we kind of drift back. And a lot of us uh, that have been in the hobby a long time drift back to the basics you know and now the stuff that i want more than anything a lot of people might consider ugly or why would you even want to mess with that but you know i'd give my left arm for a lot of the stuff that i could have had back in the day and now it's just not available anymore yeah it's tragic the way the way species are kind of lost you know but hopefully you know there are some people that are still working with the odd rarity here and there that we can, mm -hmm. we can start bringing back and and certainly importing from europe has now become a lot easier than it was you know, 10, 15 years ago. So there are some, there seem to be a lot more locality keepers and so on and rare species keepers in Europe that hopefully we can start bringing things over from. Sadly, not everything. We can't bring over Sanzinia. Right. We can't bring over fresh bloodlines of, or different bloodlines of the Argentine boas, anything Cites one, which is a pity because green Sanzinia in Europe are not expensive. <laughs> here, right. here, I think it's uh, the current going rate is a left testicle and two kidneys, yeah. right? For a, yeah, so. pretty much. <laughs> first born <laughs> yeah it's just ridiculous you know it's um hey what about you rob was there any species that you had or wanted or could have got but just let them slip by yeah i'm trying to think the certainly you know the nebulosa is the one that really jumps out to me ungaliophis all the i think that was more available right in the late 90s early 2000s than it is now um the other yeah. I think the other thing that uh, jumps out, or just a particular animal, right, was the um, the chimera an the chimera annulated tree boa that Jeff had was actually I I got that from Cameron, so it was from Quetzal, and I got it the night that it came in for the price of a normal one. Um, you know, just going out that that was kind of in the heavy duty getting stuff from Cameron every other week as shipments came in and just sort of into the mix, you know. Uh, ultimately, I think from Jeff that it didn't wind up doing anything, but it was certainly a spectacular animal. Do you have pictures of that? I don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah, hundred percent. I can send you some, and I can send you the ones from from Jeff. Where, it, but yeah, it's it it was stunning and split down the middle and uh, oh, wow. quite clearly two different snakes into one snake. That's really cool. Yeah, the joys of having contacts with an importer. You know, I, I have been on and off Cameron's price list for many years, and apparently I'm off it at the moment. I'm not seeing anything coming through. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Try, trying to get back on that thing. I difficult. think nothing's coming through to us. You know, I think it's just going to the big, yeah. the big folk. You know, I, th I yeah, that's a whole different yeah. deal. But uh, we can, yeah, we can chat about that. But, um, but yeah, that was a different time. And 
I know it was special because I believe that Ketzel even reached out to Jeff when he heard that Jeff had it. Oh, and wow. was like, oh, that's where that wound up, and that's what it looked like when it was big. Mm-hmm. Did, did Ketzel produce it? Yeah, 100%. Oh. And it came in with some really nice, uh, a whole mix. There were some colored animals, and there were some that were kind of the gray phase with the high white sides. A whole mix of stuff. I'll send yeah, you some pictures. Cool. Very neat. Yeah, I, I, uh, I need to pick up another mail for my, for my annulated I had a, I, one of my male just decided that life wasn't worth living, even though he was doing great. So uh, he just ruled the, the joys of some of these species. But um, yeah, annulate is very, very cool species, very underrated, but good to see them being produced certainly in more in greater numbers now than they have been in recent years. Yeah, I think they've taken on some uh, popularity for sure. I think, uh, you know, I see a lot of the hardcore keepers that uh, really like them, but it seems like mainstream people are starting to get turned on by them also. Um, mm-hmm. Cause they're definitely a joy to work with too. If you're used to Amazon tree bows are definitely <laughs> species that are, uh, you know, can be just as beautiful and yet uh, so much more easy to work with, you know, as far as yeah. handleability and, and all that kind of stuff. I will say that they just kind of screw with your mind quite a bit. Whenever you're in a room, that's got a bunch of other Corrales that are all trying to get you at some point. <laughs> and then you're, you're cleaning annulated and they're just sitting there and they're placid and they're kind of just looking around, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm always sitting thinking that they're just kind of scheming, kind of planning, just waiting for that prime moment to, to devour great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great species very cool yeah for sure yeah yeah so that's pretty much i guess our introductory show unless you guys have more stuff you want to add no i think i'm good i think i'm good all right uh rob is there anything else that you would like to add no i think that's fantastic uh i'm super excited for this i think it's gonna drive both our passions for boas and hopefully the audience as well so our first show uh we'll be doing in may and i believe we've decided to uh talk about the boa constrictor complex that we kind of touched on a little bit tonight um we'll dive into that a little bit deeper for our first show and uh then take it from there so thanks for listening check out the npr networks on youtube uh, channel and the website uh, moralipythonradio.com follow us on iTunes or Spotify or whatever podcast app you use and uh, thanks for listening we'll talk to you soon good night